Do you seek the darkness too? Like all from software games, Kingsfield 4 The Ancient City unwinds its story like an onion. It teases and it implies, but it is never quite explicit. Its narrative is a puzzle, a puzzle that the protagonist is attempting to put together alongside the player. What makes things a bit more difficult is the way things were done in the early aughts with regard to video game localization. If the video game industry can be declared to be relatively young, Localization and porting to the West and other parts of the world is even younger. Back when Kingsfield 4 first released in 2003, its localizers were not as keen on reproducing the scripts as faithfully as scripts would be in the present time. This is especially apparent in Kingsfield 1 to 3J, as along with dictates from platform holders that mandated changes, HTEC had to make unilateral decisions in lieu of overt guidance from From Software itself. Kingsfield 4 by HTEC is one of their most faithfully localized games. Unlike Kingsfield 2J and 3J, the Ancient City's disconnect from the first trilogy works in its favor. However, this complication, plus the general way in which From Software tells its story through environmental world design and implicit storytelling, makes Kingsfield 4, The Ancient City, a tough nut to crack. It has a penchant for leaving people new to the game with more questions than they have answers. Let's see if we can't answer some of these questions now. Before we begin, we should start with some translator's notes and some disclaimers. The Kingsfield series, though more with 1 to 3 than 4, have, as mentioned in the introduction, not had an easy time of it as far as fidelity is concerned. According to an interview with Age Tech's Jeremy Kaufman, conducted by the YouTube channel We Review Every PS2 Game Oh God, translation boiled down to a game of telephone between From Software and Age Tech. This, along with a general lack of interest from From Software and their Western audience at the time, Sony's own interdicts about changing all Japanese names, and Age Tech's need to outsource dubbing would result in some less than stellar translations during the PlayStation and early PlayStation 2 generations. Kingsfield 4 would fare much better than the original Verdite trilogy in the US, though its script would suffer in other ways. The Age Tech release suffers from poor polish with strange grammatical errors sprinkled throughout. Names would be changed, probably still adhering to Sony localization rules, taking names from those from the official Kingsfield fan forum. HTEC's writers would also expand on the notes in the original Japanese manual, iterating upon what is already written and expanding upon the story there. The less said about Metro 3D's release of Kingsfield 4, the better. This would present a few challenges to me and to root out the true lore of Kingsfield 4, the ancient city, and how best to present that lore in an easily digestible way. Therefore, there are a few rules that I will adhere to. 1. While I'm not fluent in Japanese, I have used DPEL as my machine translator of choice, as it is the most naturalistic and most correct machine translator on the internet. I've gone through after the fact to clean it up using my own knowledge of Japanese. Two. The script will primarily refer to the US names, as those are the names this video's primary audience will be at home with. However, I will make note of their original names either on screen, the script, or in both. 3. Iterations to the script or lore written by HTEC will be noted on screen or in the script. The Ancient City is a parable that warrants against imbalance. Its thesis statement in the narrative weaves its way in towards the end game, when Devian has become acquainted with the ancient city, and has begun to reach the bottom of the central Ziggurat Tower. 
The curse of the ancient city is that the civilizations that seek to call it home have repeated their mistakes again and again, a cycle that leaves nothing but ruin in its wake. Long ago, there was nothing else but the duality of darkness and light. Light itself was the shadow of darkness, and from the light, the forest of sacred trees was born. The trees of the forest serve as the fulcrum between the darkness and the light, the point of which the balance between the two are held. In a time that is too old to be called ancient, the first of the inhabitants called the city home. Devian finds their ruins in some of the deepest reaches of the ancient city, in the deep dark and buried both by soil and by stagnant, befouled waters. There was only chaos in the beginning. We found darkness and welcomed it. Darkness is peace and a fail. We worshipped and lived with it. The uncertainty presented by the perceived chaos spurred the ancient peoples to seek out order. In a way, this might be a stinging rebuke to conformity in a culture that seeks out neat order among all things, something it has in common with Elden Ring. What the ancient peoples sought was an escape from the disorder and the shifting chaos that they perceived. Kingsfield 4 doesn't delve too deep into the primordial chaos which the Antediluvian peoples sought refuge from, just they did. In the darkness they found a sort of peace and the uncertainty that the ancient peoples sought shielded from the chaos that they were so afraid of. One might envision the city in the darkness as a cold, dark place with kind inhabitants. The darkness is cold and hides everything. Dark and peaceful, the veil of life. This peace was not to last as the ancient peoples worship the darkness would prove folly and rear an ugly, disastrous head. The regret would be palpable in the ruins that they left in the world. After a long time, the darkness spiraled out of control and engulfed everything. We sealed the altar and returned to the beginning. The ancient people had a problem on their hands because of their ignorance of how the world even worked and with a myopic need to escape a chaos they were so uncomfortable with, they gave the proverbial keys to the kingdom to the darkness. Their worship of the darkness was akin to throwing an accelerant on a fire. The power that they had unwittingly given to the darkness through their worship shattered the balance of what the primordial people were ignorant to. The darkness was a living, breathing thing, and through their empowerment of it, it was able to grow out of control and threaten to devour everything, including their civilization. Unbalanced power brings destruction. Never approach the darkness you have sealed away. Let our end be a warning. Knowing that their world was crashing down on them, the primordial peoples attempted one last thing, sealing themselves and the darkness away. Their voices reverberate in what is, in the end, a graveyard, a tomb, and a monument to their mistakes in an attempt to warn those who would find their watery graves the lessons they learned too late. There is a balance to the world, one that rests between the light and the darkness. Empowering the darkness with worship and life causes an imbalance that would only reward disaster. Those caught beneath the ripples of the befouled waters would eventually, in time, become known as the Dark Ones. So. One of the difficulties that comes up with translation is actually what words from software will end up using to write lore. In fact, this is something that will trip up Japanese lore hunters as well as those of us working in translation. In this aside, 
we'll talk about one place where these oddities come up. The word tobari is one example where a word will trip up a translator and force a bit of digging around. Machine translation will actually default this word, tobari, as book. Though the saying peace in the book doesn't actually work well in this instance and seems to muddy the meaning that From Software was going for in Kingsfield 4. Dictionary definitions from Wikitionary state that this word actually has two meanings. The first is a curtain or a drape, the same sort that the nobility would use. This actually is the primary meaning for nouns. Tobari's other definition is notebooks or ledgers like the machine translation will spit out, but this is strange if not archaic as most will use the word hon to mean book. However, what is interesting about this is that the definition can actually fit two, as a ledger also holds a double meaning in English. Along with possible definitions as a simple notebook, particularly in an accounting, it can also be used as a name for the flat stone that covers graves. The Chinese definition for tobadi becomes a curtain against mosquitoes. Because of all of this, the decision was made to see the word being used as a sort of veil, the same sort that separates the living and the dead, and in this case the darkness from the chaos that the primordial peoples were seeking to escape from. But this veil would only become their burial shroud. Up ahead is the king's chamber. It is the place where those who have served the forest for generations go to sleep, and it is also where the five scepters room, where the precept of travel is kept. The primordial people would soon become only a memory, shrouded in death, and in their watery graves deep below the earth and far below the light. After their passing, the ancient city, as the world would come to know, would be built in earnest by the forest folk who would sprout above the dead memories of the primordial peoples. The city itself would be a well-organized, vertical, underground metropolis. The age tech localizations, as an aside, would suggest the forest people did this as direct sunlight would burn them, though this is not said in the Japanese scripts and seems to be a slight misrepresentation of a poem written by a need vigil. Each floor was reserved for a specific tradesperson so that they may hone their crafts. For instance, machinists would live and work on the west side of floor two. General craftspeople would live on the east end of floor 3. Each entrance to each sector would be framed by a gate. The Silver Gate being the link between the ancient city and the surface. Later on, the earth folk, deeply talented blacksmiths, would be invited to settle within the ancient city as well. In the beginning, the holy capital flourished and the city itself was considered a sacred place for the forest people Dragons would fly about the city, a creature that would festoon the ancient city's most sacred places like the ancient city's crown jewel, the king's chambers, situated near the surface. Not only was this a place of honor, it was the location of the ancient city's crown jewels, the five scepters, each imbued with the precept of travel, as well as the secret passage through the ancient city's monarchy, with its symbol of a monarch. The home of the Moonlight Sword. It's rare to see a human being here. This is the forest of the sacred tree, the mother forest of us forest people. One case of the forest folk that should be spotlighted here is the priesthood. While from what we glean from the ancient city is that the forest folk were makers, they were also deeply spiritual. This case is the only case we come to know via its lone survivor, a Nid Vigil, known as Emil Eto in the Japanese scripts. The priesthood maintained the balance between light and dark, though it is difficult to ascertain from the script if the priesthood understood that this was what they were doing. In essence, the priesthood were charged with maintaining the holy forest and feeding the dew produced by the trees to the golems that were their protectors. 
Trees are the ontological fulcrum between the light and dark, and its roots take in the nutrients of death and darkness along with the nutrients afforded by the light of the sun through its leaves. Through this, they are able to synthesize the powerful drops of dew that is so prized by the priesthood. The others have already gone to sleep. A time will come for me, too. It's my destiny. Unfortunately, Anid is one of two forest folk survivors and the only priest left within the ancient city. Her destiny is a melancholy one, to join the rest of the priesthood as they go to sleep, which, from how it's presented, seems analogous to passing away. Anid seems to have accepted this fate as her destiny, one that will come one day, and ending the line of priests who have protected the forest since time immemorial. The ancient city would grow in its continuing construction deep into the earth would continue. But shadows were creeping nearer to the ancient city as their continued expansion would put them face to face with their doom. When the city was being built, a dark shrine was discovered at the far end of the city. The king of the forest forbade anyone to approach it, but the prince who disobeyed the king's order was banished from the city. The prince was eventually released from exile and returned to the capital. Later, someone opened the door to the shrine, and the capital was thrown into chaos. Then, the king of the forest was assassinated. In ancient conflict, journal entries from Devian Rosberg. The forest of sacred trees would be flourishing at this point, basking in the light that shines overhead. A new people would come and establish lives here, tending to the forest and enjoying the protection of the green canopy overhead. The ancient city continued on its expansion, racing into the earth and continuing to build until they came face to face with their destiny, as they would discover the watery grave that the Dark Ones have been sealed into. The king forbade anyone from approaching, but was too late to stop his son, the prince, from becoming seduced by the darkness. He was exiled and later forgiven, but the downfall of the ancient city had already begun. Hard-won lessons, however, would need to be taught once more. There was once a king who thought light was supreme, and the king wanted to reign over the city. He built a shrine where the light could gather, but worship eventually became in awe. The shrine was closed, and the king too was sealed away somewhere. Were the deeds of the ancient kings wrong? Light is the shadow of the darkness, and in a similar way to what happened to the primordial peoples, the light entranced the unnamed king of the forest. He worshipped the light and built a shrine where the light could gather and pool. He was fervent and obsessed, and to him the light would become a weapon in which he would be the undisputed sovereign of the ancient city. Things spiraled out of control, and the king erected the dangerous Path of Light, a place wrapped in storms and lightning, and where four armed constructs holding false moonlight swords protect towers empowered by this befouled light. Of interest, though, are the treasures that are also protected by the false moonlight sword constructs. They are opened by the ancient key, which is obtained in the graveyard of the primordial people, perhaps pointing to another influence upon an unraveling king. The balance of the world dipped another way, and light threatened to devour just as dark did so long ago. In his madness, as worshipped was twisted to greed. The king was a figure devoured by his throne. He was sealed away, very close to the throne but forever apart from it, only attended by the endless army of skeletons at his heel. Worship the light. The light is supreme. The 
Cave Take localization, however, does something a little bit differently. Nearby, at the conclusion of the Path of Light, is a petrified skeleton that still holds the soul and sapience of its owner. The Age Tech script names this voice the King of the Forest, which confuses the lore around this event. The Japanese script simply names the voice a muffled voice, potentially the formerly exiled Prince of the Forest, a voice that speaks of a great will that has now entrusted everything to our protagonist, Devian. With this in mind, we could surmise that this might have been an attempt by Age Tech to streamline this bit of the story, but in so doing created another king and a conflict of succession. Even so, this voice tells us something very important about the inner workings of light and dark, both ontological concepts that must be balanced against each other, otherwise doom will befall the land. When the light is strong, the darkness is also strong. Maybe having the power of light to resist the dark ones is not truly the right thing to do. This voice speaks to the tragedies that fall upon the people who call the ancient city their home. Seeing their beloved forest folk be swallowed by the darkness filled them with despair, and he sought the power of the Moonlight Blade. He failed, triggered by his doubt and not knowing that the answer lies in the balance. The voice became nothing else but a ghost clinging to their body mere inches from the ultimate light crystal and mere feet from the heart of the holy forest. A need vigil's mention of the story of an ancient forest folk already suggests how long ago it was, even for her, the last priestess of the holy forest. The story is something she offers only towards the end of the game, after the player finds their way to the ancient ruins and graveyard of the Dark Ones. This easily pairs with and reinforces the themes of balance, light, and dark, balancing one another. The chaos that befell the ancient city was triggered by the opening of the shrine and the obsession of the former king, in a light that, like the dark is threatening to do, devoured the king of the forest himself and potentially his family. But the war had only just begun. The king was dead, seduced by the light, consumed by it, and sealed away in a mausoleum. The Dark Ones had been released by someone after the shrine was discovered, its own seduction of those near was near total and complete. The war and struggle between light and dark was underway. The newly crowned King of Darkness has risen an army, led by four generals including a dark witch and a dark priest. Two men rose to the occasion to try to defend the ancient city from the encroaching darkness. The first was Serak Rosmash, known in Japanese as Serak So, and the other was Lord Mew, who was known in Japanese as Sapora Mew. At the end of the war with the Dark Ones, I created Jania and her friends to protect the city. They have gone mad. It is the reward for foolishly violating the laws of nature. I have turned to myself into stone as a warning. The secret of the rebirth of the Jania is in the water. That dirty water is the source of falsehood. Serak Razmash. Serak Razmash was a craftsman, and the Lord of the Hall of Windsong refused to stand by and watch the children of the forest be destroyed. Unfortunately, his quest to try to save the life of his people led him down some dark paths. His search for knowledge led him as well to the grave of the Dark Ones and came upon the knowledge of the creation of artificial life. In violation of the laws of evolution and committing a grave sin against nature itself, Serak created life, a creature he calls the Janians. These Janians are guardians, much like the creatures that were little more than golems initially meant as weapons against the Dark. The Janians, however, would fall to madness because the Dark and would instead attack its creators and anyone it would see. Racked with guilt, Serac regretted using the knowledge gained from the stagnant water of the Grave of the Dark Ones and petrified himself in stone, hidden away in the mansion of Howling Winds he was master of. Surrounded by the judging faces of the children of the forest, he attempted and failed to save. In the 
midst of all of this, the Earth Folk. The forger craftsmen invited to the Holy City by the Forest Folk would themselves face their own calamities. Its chieftain would himself be seduced by the power of the darkness and cold, and would, under this entrancement, find the idol of ice, an axe, and attack his own kin with it. At the end of the chieftain's rampage, he froze himself into blocks of ice, and along with the demon that would block the lava flowing into the Earth's folk's forges, the entire home of the Earth folk went cold and dark. Sapora Mew is the highest ranking warrior among the forest people. It is said that he was always at the forefront of the fight when the conflict with Dark Ones began. Warrior of the Forest, from the Journal of Devian Rosberg. While Serac was attempting to create weapons to assist in the defense of the children of the forest, Lord Mew took the fight directly to the Dark Ones. He was feared, and under his leadership, the armies of the Light and its dragons, he drove many of the Dark One's armies to the battlefield, back to just outside of their broken prison. After establishing a frontline fortress, the battlefield was a place of horror and a churning stalemate. Skirmishes would become battles, and battles would grow in ferocity and destruction. His armor would be a symbol that would instill fear in the demons of the Dark, as well as the sight of his holy sword. However, the constant murder and the blood of Mew's hands would stain his soul and destroy him from within. His sword and his sword arm would become cursed and Mew's time would be cut short. Mew's last battle in what would become the decisive battle wreathed in miasma and dark with toxic, foul waters around them Mew would defeat the greatest of the Dark One's knights. But instead of regrouping at the dungeon fort of the Forest Folk's army, Mew would cut down the bridge and commit suicide with his cursed arm, ending his life and the continuing soiling of his soul. Mew's armor would be stripped from him and spirited away by the Dark Ones and magically sealed. The Dark Ones hoping that no one else could claim the feared warrior's mantle ever again. Sapora Mew, the warrior of the forest, has defeated many demons. Perhaps because of this, the sword he held in his hands was cursed, and it is said that in his final moments, he took his own life with it. The cursed sword still remains in the ruins of the battlefield. From the Journal of Devian Rosberg. Lord Mew's sacrifice, however, would be for naught, as the darkness would eventually flood out from its bonds and into the city. The armies of the light would be routed, its dragons falling like leaves across the ancient battleground to become nothing but skeletons. With no one else to protect the city, those who survived would scatter to the four winds, into the world, and away from the ancient city. The once sacred city of the forest folk would be raised and fall dormant, a haven for demons and their ilk. However, the darkness would not be content with what it had won, and it would strive to continue to do what it does best, consume. Years would pass. History becomes legend. Ruins become the only witness that anything was amiss at all. The memory of the people who lived there only exists in scholars and dusty tomes. Those who survived the destruction of the ancient city was scattered to the four winds, exiled from the Holy Land they once called home. Over time, the Holy Land that was once the cradle of their civilization would become the Land of Disaster a sobriquet that can also be translated as mischief or misfortune. At the foot of what would become known as the Land of Disaster, the twin kingdoms of Haladin, or Heliodor, and Azalin, or Calcite, would rise. A note about names. 
The original name for the twin kingdoms of man featured in Kingsfield 4 are Heliodor and Calcite. And both follow the old from software naming conventions in Kingsfield of naming their kingdoms after magical crystals and minerals, all of which empower magic such as Verdite. Heliodor is also known as Golden Barrel, and its name derives from the Greek word for the sun, Helios. Calcite, either clear or alabaster white, is a form of calcium carbonate. It can form in any number of ways and is, in the end, quite common. What is the most interesting, though, is that much of it is formed by the shells of long dead marine life forms. Calcite is a fiefdom within the kingdom of Heliodor, according to the Japanese texts. Ruled by the ancient Rosberg family and located by the North Sea, it is a peaceful kingdom that has maintained itself exclusively through diplomacy. Its royalty, the Rosbergs, are born with and are known for their magical powers and being staunchly anti-war. Some speculate that the Rosbergs are related to the children of the forest, though at the beginning of the quest, no one is sure of the truth. In Age Tech Histories, the Rosberg family is blessed with the following magical abilities, pyromancy, precognition, and general magic. Likewise, the Rosberg family are rumored to be descended from the children of the forest, who predate the race of man and cannot stand in direct light of the sun. Prince Devian Rosberg, who in Japanese is named Ixian Rosberg, is third in line for the Aslan throne and unfortunately does not seem to have the magical aptitude as the rest of his family. Instead, he trains under Septigo, the sword master of Haladin. Haladin, located at the foot of the Land of Disaster, lives and thrives almost in defiance of its infamous neighbor. Revitalized by the ascension of a new, young king, the kingdom has been growing rapidly, causing a sense of unease with the surrounding areas, most notably Aslan. This rapid growth would come to an end with the new moon. The new young king of Haladin during the new moon was presented with a statue. Its seduction was complete and total as it consumed the young king with obsession, keeping it as his side everywhere he went. Since the statue's appearance within the kingdom of Haladin, dark clouds began to gather while calamities and plagues threatened to extinguish the land. As though a mirror to his own kingdom, the young king was not spared the plagues and calamities, and he found himself on his deathbed. In desperation, the chief of swords was dispatched with a column of the army on an expedition to the land of disaster, and was not heard from again. In lore added by Age Tech Entertainment, the young king was crowned King Lucian IV the Wise after the sudden death of his father. Its aforementioned expansion was the result of a desire for colonial imperialism, annexing unconquered lands. This caused a rift with King Aslan of the Rosberg family, who was a close friend of King Lucian IV's father. At the Horned Moon Festival to celebrate the new moon, the idol, which is said to represent the highest ideals of peace, was offered to King Lucian. Entranced, King Lucian IV enshrined the idol in his throne room. Black clouds roil in after this, with plagues and disasters striking soon after. Lucian IV is himself not spared and is struck down by the plagues that spring up within his kingdom. Though the land of disaster was long abandoned, it didn't stop the desperate from entering its darkened depths. Some time ago, the so-called Stone of Life was discovered along with its healing properties. Though in truth, the Stone of Life is essentially a limestone that has absorbed the healing waters that flow through the land of disaster. This was not understood truly by the people who started to flock to the location, and instead they believed the miraculous healing properties came from the stone itself, rather than what the stone itself played host to. These were the desperate and the weary, such as Jean or the Jeanette family. 
the mother and daughter found themselves within the ruins of the surface commons to the ancient city because of the mother's named Elaine or Cheryl's illness. In desperation, their husband and father went to work in the mine nearby to find another stone of life. The people here, however, weren't fully aware of the danger that they were in and the threats hiding amongst the ruins of the ancient city's mouth. Or, perhaps, they didn't care. Unbeknownst to them, the darkness's corruptive consumption has reached the surface and was seeping upwards. The mind that sought life uncovered death. The darkness seeped through the open wounds in the ground like some sort of toxic miasma and would start to kill the miners that hoped to find salvation. They would rise again as zombies, continuing their final, desperate actions. The patriarch of the Jean Jeanette family would be one of these victims, finding his death before being able to save his wife from her disease. Septigo, or Klaus as he is known in Japanese, Swordmaster and Knight of Haladin, was sent by royal decree to the land of disaster in an attempt to return the Idol of Sorrow back to the ancient city. It was a last, desperate attempt at saving themselves. Well armed and well prepared with the ancestral sword of Haladin, the lawful blade, and with a column of the army at his back, they arrived at the mining camps and ruins located at the ancient city's mouth. In truth, this location is called the Temple of Oath, a ruin of a symbol of friendship between the forest folk of the ancient city and the humans who lived on the surface. Here, Septigo and his expedition would break their initial camp. However, nearly immediately after their arrival, the calamities would begin to befall the Haladin expedition. Imagine the silent skitter of a bug across the ground. How much would you think of it? Would you even notice it as it moves across the grasses? Do you think it would take note of the massive people in its midst? Do you think it would care? Now, Imagine it crawling up a leg as you sat at a bonfire. Would you notice it then? Would you notice it as it moved into your hair? Or would you notice it too late as it sinks its mandibles into your neck and your entire world goes dark? That was the first terror that fell upon the Haladin expedition. Cockroaches swarmed the expedition, demonizing and rendering undead those who were unlucky enough to be nearest to their tiny feet and near the rear of the column. The newly possessed, then, would attack those who were not possessed by the demons of the ancient city, and in this initial milieu, the rear supply troops were annihilated speaking to the intelligence of the Dark Ones that prowl the ancient city. The expedition would retreat deeper into the ancient city, past the Temple of Oath, unable to go backwards. They would leave their former compatriots, now under the control of the dark, to roam aimlessly around the hallways, swinging at anything they came into contact with, with no control over their own selves. A giant spider would seal their point of egress, and without pyromancy, the survivors of the Haladin expedition were sealed into the ancient city, with no real method of escape. The son of man and the people of the forest to make up for each other's deficiencies. To live together, I write here with Nier. The ancient city's Silver Gate was a place of vital importance as it was the border between the surface and underworld metropolis that was the ancient city. It was a place of commerce, exchange, diplomacy, and friendship, and was one of the more important locations for the ancient city. 
In observance of this importance, the Temple of Oath was born. It was a monument to the friendship offered and shared between the children of man and the children of the forest. In that friendship, the forest priest Orson offered something extraordinary to the children of men, a healing spring. Mr. Fapa, or Ulf Oz, tells us the old story. When the ancient city flourished, Orison created the healing spring and offered it to the children of men to heal their weary bodies. That water was powerful and able to restore a person's vitality as they worked and lived in the village that sprung up around the Silver Gate and the Temple of Oath. Orson modeled his fountain spring after the ones within the ancient city itself at its most sacred places, complete with carvings dedicated to the ancient dragons. But when calamity and chaos swept through the ancient city, Orson did not want the healing spring to become a source of violence. He did not wish the children of man to commodify it, to capitalize on it, to gatekeep it, or lead them to violence to fight over it in his absence. The spring, then, was shut off. Orson made a choice and cut the healing waters off in the Temple of Oath, letting the pools become fetid, stagnant, and poisonous. Some of the water, with no place to go, flowed through the limestone rocks in the surrounding land, leading the desperate to seek out stones of life and to establish a mine to find more. This would inadvertently give the dark the ability to threaten the surface world as it oozed up to the surface, using the mining shafts as facilitators. Perhaps that was Orson's sin, to not trust humanity with powerful healing waters and to sentence them to their own doom. Or perhaps he made the right decision to slow their doom from finding them. The dead are screaming. Be careful if you go on ahead. With their supply line cut, and their rear now littered with their demon-possessed countrymen, the expedition continued the only way it could, forward. But the way forward was, unfortunately, as much as a death trap for them as retreating back to the Temple of Oath. The path that Devian takes further into the city himself comes into contact with the scattered remains of Septigo's column. One, Ramirez Martin, or Bayo Morden, who was attacked by his fellow soldiers, can do nothing but offer advice on the golems and sell goods to Devian. In another place, Devian encounters a knight by the name of Linus Greece, or Belric Sitar, who is so traumatized by his situation and confused by the labyrinthine nature of the ancient city, can do nothing but use his grand lance to try to draw maps on the floor to try to remember just who he is. But the biggest threat the expedition faced came in the guise of the terrifying snake men, the Witta, or Ophidians. There are many demons nesting in the ancient city, but Ophidians are one of the most feared. It is said that a group of the expedition was annihilated by their hands. Ophidian Part 2 from the Journal of Devian Rosberg. The Witta, or named Ophidian after a type of snake in the Japanese scripts, are the most feared demon that roamed the ancient city's ruins. They can be found in most places, brandishing scimitars and swords, and are some of the most aggressive of the enemies found within the ancient city. They murder members of the Column of Expedition soldiers systematically 
but the Witta are hiding a blasphemous secret. In a final battle between the Witta and the tattered remains of Septigo's army, the Witta capture Septigo and the Lawful Blade and drag him away into the palace of the Witta Queen. This shatters whatever remains of the expedition well and truly, leaving the rest to either fight futilely against their own coming doom or to try to hunker down with each other and hope to survive, unable to save their leader and helpless in the face of the dark. Unfortunately, neither of these would prove to be a wise course of action. One group, hidden in the sea caves near the Widow Queen's castle, are attempting to decide on their next course of action. They were attacked by a terrifyingly strong Widow soldier and have lost their swords in the battle. They are uncertain on how to pass through the Widow Castle's flames defenses, and so they sit crestfallen and unable to do anything to save Septigo while one of their group tries and fails to satiate his hunger. The Witta, being reptiles, are hatched from eggs, and one of the most fortified locations for the Witta is the egg field. Though it is unsaid if these are the eggs they are hatched from, the place is so fortified that one must fight through the Witta Queen and her attendants to gain entry to it. While being hatched is one way in which the Witta can reproduce, it, terrifyingly, isn't the only way. Horrifyingly, the main way in which the Widow reproduce is from the wounds given to others following an encounter with them. Once again, the dark turns friend into foe. As mentioned, the final survivors of the Haladin expedition were attacked by a horrifyingly strong Widow soldier. One man in particular, Lyle Kagada, or Rod Lithgow, was injured, as seen on his bandages. What he didn't know is that the venom from his enemy was seeping into his blood and causing his intense hunger. The scales crawl up the back of his head like a rising tide, and his tongue changes first, slithering out of his mouth to taste the air. By the time Devian returns, Lyle has eaten his compatriots. Devian, realizing that the eggs are medicine, as Cecil Burley, or Og Burley, informs us, causes us to pass off our last strange egg to Lyle as food. Greedily devouring it, potentially an infa widow in a life for life, he soon is cured of the rot that was destroying him and leaving him only with the horror and guilt of what he's done. Should Devian not seek to cure Lyle, his transformation consumes him, and he finishes his transformation into another minion of the dark. The Witta are transformed soldiers of the expedition, and one of the ways in which they reproduce is in the forcible transformation of the strong into one of their ilk using the queen's abilities. With his column shattered, Septigo with the Lawful Blade is dragged before the Widow Queen. Her goal was to reawaken the King of the Dark, and her attempt to raise her army of Widow is in preparation for that promised day of the King of the Dark's return. The Lawful Blade and Septigo were recognized and locked away into the dungeon. Curiously, they did not kill Septigo themselves. Perhaps they were hoping to offer Septigo to the King of the Dark. In the dungeon, Septico dies by his own hand using the Lawful Blade. Devian finds him still heavily armored and with the Lawful Blade at his shoulder, completely and totally forgotten. Septico's last words, both carved into the wall and in his own blood by his shoulder, beseech the heir to his will, the heir to his sword, to return the statue to where it belongs and to seal away the darkness. Though we've gotten quite ahead of ourselves as we followed the doomed Haladin expedition into the ancient city, let's take a few steps back and talk about Devian or Ixion Rosberg and his quest of self-discovery. According to the age tech localizations and additions to the story, 
Devian is the third in line to the Aslan throne. While he was a member of the royal house of Rosberg, the age tech localization stresses that Devian's magic has not blossomed in him, considered strange as his royal house is marked by magical aptitude and known for their aptitude in pyromancy, precognition, and general magic. Instead, he is sent to ward with Septigo or Klaus and reveals his talent with a sword under Septigo's tutelage. As a member of the Aslan royal house, Devian is also rumored to be descended from the forest folk who fled the fall of the ancient city. As a reminder, Devian's position within the line of succession in the Aslan royal house, nor his inaptitude with magic is written about in the Japanese manuals or scripts. Was it dark? Or was it just the clouds outside? Devian's story begins with a sound, a loud banging on the doors to his small cottage. There is a fire going on in the receiving area, and its crackling continues unbothered by the incessant banging on the door. Traveling down the stairs, there's a hesitation, as though unsure to open the door. But when Devian does, a heavily robed person offers the Idol of Sorrow to Devian. The path it takes is generally shown in the opening cinematics, from the forest to the ancient city in the hands of an armored person whose bloodied handprint signals their failure, to the streets of the city of Haladin and the rats, symbolic of the plague that has fallen on the castle. Then, finally, into the hands of the expedition, the size and scope of it stretches for miles. From there, it is difficult to know what the path the idol took or who the robed figure was who materialized before Devian actually are, and the game makes no attempt at explaining it. It is simply fate, a curse. From there, the idol of sorrow is Devian's constant companion, and even with attempts to leave it with others, it will always somehow find its way to him. Devian knows what this is, and what it means for him to have it. Heladin's expedition, his sword master Septigo, has fallen, and somehow, he has been chosen to hold the idol. Prince Devian Rosberg of the House of Alzalin, despite his station and the stylings of his name, does something the Haladin expedition does not. Where the soldiers of Haladin were loud about their arrival, and their massive column of soldiers, Devian sneaks into the land of disaster by himself and is largely unarmed. Cloaked, he is anonymous as he picks his way through the village that has sprung up because of hope and comes across the scattered and shattered remains of the Haladin expedition. Most of the survivors are wrestling with their guilt and trauma over what they've experienced. Devian isn't actually a silent protagonist in this game. Instead, he journals. He writes about those people who he has come across and the places he finds within the ancient city. He makes suppositions and writes about his discoveries and makes a note that leather armor smells terribly. They aren't very long entries, merely notes he scribbles while at a campfire, but it does track his growing body of knowledge. At the Temple of Oath, for instance, Devian finds a family, a girl, her dog, and her sick mother waiting for their patriarch to return to the Stone of Life. They do not know that the Dark's corruptive, corrosive, and noxious influence has already killed and rendered undead the miners inside, limply swinging their pickaxes. They merely think it's manageable with some antidote grasses. They wait all the same. Durin Path Warden or Woe's Taft is met at the edge of the town, desperate to return to his wife, but he is stymied by broken paths and is later driven into the corner of a rundown chapel, unable to cut through the monsters. Despite Devian's best attempt, the man meets his end by risen skeletons who have no other ability than violence. Devian defeats the lone reaper in the game, a sentient flesh-tree monster 
that may have been Durin Path Warden's wife at one point. The Reaper attempts to destroy the prince, but with the Reaper's defeat, leaves something that unlocks Devian's latent magical ability, the Clarity Bracelet. Continuing, Devian meets more of the cast of characters within the ancient city, each more tragic than the last. From the researcher to the Grand Lance Knight, who must fight, but also is confused by the layout of the city. From the treasure hunters who found more than they ever bargained for, as well as less. The earth folk blacksmith who plies his trade to try to forget his recently escaped frozen prison. To the lonely priestess who is confined to the one place of the forest that staved off the darkness. Through it all, Devian grows in strength and hones his newly awakened magical ability as he travels through the ancient city. His arc shifts when he meets his master, Septigo's body with the lawful blade. By then, he realizes that the rumors were true. He is descended from the forest folk. His royal line is older than he can imagine. His quest to do what the Haladin expedition failed to do also shifts in scope. It becomes less of a return to the idol and more a finish of what his forebears, Sirach and Mew, started. Bring back a balance to the light and darkness dichotomy. It is Devian's necessity to synthesize the art of the sword and the art of the book into a single power, much like the trees of the forest do as they synthesize the nutrients found in the dark, rich ground as well as the bright sunlight in the dew. The lessons, the tragedies of this, are set in front of him as he seeks to bring the power of the Lawful Blade back and unlock its truth as the Moonlight Sword. By the time the idol crumbles in front of him, it becomes evidently true what the idol was attempting to do the whole time. To find a king worthy of the dark. The one who sits the throne has failed. The pitiful creature has half become part and parcel of the writhing mass, the darkness that is ever consuming. This creature simply sits and waits, ever seeking the dark. Should Devian not realize his potential, and strike a balance within himself, and not claim the Moonlight Sword reborn from the Lawful Blade, Devian will fall for the idol's trap. He will merely replace the pitiful king, sitting on a throne of flesh in the dark. If, however, Devian realizes his potential in himself, awakens the kingly blood within his veins, realizes the balance and claims the Moonlight Sword, he brings peace upon the land and breaks the clouds that have fallen on the kingdoms, cutting through the dark. Devian's name and his sword lives on indefinitely while the ancient city grows forgotten be claimed by the forest itself. A sense of balance restored. And the king and his sword lived on 